How much fertilizer do we really need? The Soil Health Field Day at the farm of Dave Brandt over in Carroll, Ohio on April 5th, 2017. Coverage sponsored by Buckeye Soil Solutions, Agco, Mayor Farm Equipment, United Landmark LLC, Will Rogers Entertaining Speaker. It's time to hear from farmers on experiences with reduced fertilizer inputs, including Keith Dennis of Perry County and David Brandt of Fairfield County. Good morning. Is this on now? You hear me? Keep trying. Pull it back. Now? There you go. There you go. Good morning. I'd like to start out with asking the veterans from all the countries that are here, would they please raise their hand? All of our veterans. Without, without the service of you gentlemen and ladies to our country, we wouldn't be able to have a meeting like this today and talk about the stuff like we're talking about. Uh, so I thank all of you for your service and all of our active people are keeping us free while we enjoy the liberties that we have. Uh, Dave knows that I live uh, in my own little world <laughs> over in Perry County and the best thing about that is I know everybody. Yeah. Me. <laughs> Dave and I have been requested that, uh, as you can see, that we take a uh, fitness class. <laughs> we went to the first class and the lady says, well, you need to get yourself some loose, loose clothing. And we both told her that, hey, if we had loose clothing, we sure wouldn't be here for the fitness class. <laughs> <laughs> You heard uh, Gabe, he took most of my material. He stole that from me overnight, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, you heard uh, Ray, he's got uh, lots of college education. Dr. Haney has a PhD. But what Dave and I haven't told him and Gabe is that we've got two PhDs. Yes. One from the V Ohio School of Hard Knocks and the School of Mother Nature. And it has proven to be quite an interesting process. Thanks to Dr. Haney and Ray and David. Yes. Uh, we've, uh, my wife and I have come a long way. We operate 600 acres. I will tell you before we start into my presentation, don't expect to see profit margins on our farm like you've seen on Gabe's. <laughs> He has done a miraculous job, but he's been at it 30 more years than I have, and as has David. We started in uh, 2011. As you can see on the screen, uh, I've entitled this, Money Saved Results of Leaving Your P&K in Your Salesman's Inventory Instead of in Your Soil. I think that's a, uh, did we turn that off? Yeah, there it is. Um, have you ever, attended meetings that promoted three to five bushel, and I know that a lot of you have. I attended one a couple of weeks ago, and I know everybody except Gabe, big money as Ray calls him, uh, <laughs> is, is sitting around and trying to do their budgets and everything and worrying about uh, how they can cut a little bit here and a little bit there to make everything come out. Uh, have you ever attended meetings that would say to, that you could tell somebody that this meeting can save me 100 to 500 dollars an acre? I'm here to tell you that it is possible, and it's showed up on our our farms, uh, so it can be done. And when you're looking at budgets and corn prices and grain prices, most of us are. Um, trying to get by on the commodity prices because we haven't gotten our soil health and everything to go the way it is. You purchase products to make a small income with a small plot result. We've all purchased new technology, uh, things that will, as the salesman has said, help us improve our yields and what it's done is improved our pocketbook. 
where no-till cover crops, reducing inputs, increased profit is looked at as not scientific. <laughs> Gabe, Gabe touched on this. If we wait on science to catch up and tell everybody it's all right, we're probably all going to be broke. We started out uh, 60, 80 years ago with plowing. Uh, salesmen come around and said, man, you can chisel plow. Be better. Chisel plow brought on more weeds, as Gabe said. Then we had to get stronger chemicals. Then we had to put on more fertilizer. And all that was scientific, according to the, to the salesman. And what did we end up with? What Gabe showed on his slides of dead soil. I came into uh, a meeting several weeks ago that the salesman was promoting a technology, quote unquote, to put on your planter. That would give you, tell you what seeds, how many seeds you were dropping, how much down pressure you had, and a mirage of other things. He said it might make you three to five bushel. But on the outer perimeter of the map he had drawn, the outside rows were in, outlined in red. He said we don't use the outside rows to promote our product because those outside rows are skewed. <laughs> I thought, then why are we putting on fertilizing chemicals on the outside rows if we're not getting the potential yield? End rows will yield less, do wildlife trees, compaction. So why are we putting those, those costs out there when we can put cover crops on and cost a whole bunch less and not have the expense? You want to tell them about that, uh, how you got me started? Uh, Keith attended a meeting here uh, uh, as a conventional farmer and had preventive planting. And evidently we, uh, of course, Ray can sell an Eskimo a freezer. So he sold uh, Keith the idea that he needed to change. Uh, so we uh, worked with Keith and uh, got him to plant some peas and radishes uh, with his Kenzie planter and began his journey to understand how to uh, uh, reduce inputs and improve uh, his soils. So these are some of the things that uh, we had talked to him about and kind of set up a little program that uh, would help him to get started. When I mentioned this College of Hard, hard Knocks, they were hard knocks <laughs> in 2014. 2012, there's a picture of the drought year, the first year after my peas and radishes of a crop of corn. With uh, We did at that time use uh, the leavings of the fertilizer that was left over because we didn't plant in, in 11. That year was pretty bad for the conventional farmers. There's what your uh, conventional, and these fields were 300 feet apart. There's like a three bushel yield there compared to my, my hundred. That was pretty, pretty shocking to see that happen. In 14, this is what my corn looked like in the end of June and July, looking up towards the farm. There's what the corn looked like in 16. The reason I'm showing these pictures is we're going to get into what looked uh, good, how it went totally south. On the left side, the all red, all the, the legends on these two years in 2014-2016 are the same. Ray, Rick's test, the Haney test showed that we needed uh, about 60 units of N to produce 150 bushel of corn. Those red areas produced zero, zero yield. The 600 acres made 40 bushel to the acre average on the whole farm. If anybody was in their right mind, they would have said screw cover crops and went back to the conventional way. But uh, with David's help, Ray's help and Rick's and the test, 
I decided that there was something else wrong. You want to carry on? Uh, what we was looking at was uh, uh, applications of uh, herbicides, uh, uh, different ways to do things, uh, and uh, trying to uh, figure out how to make Keith's uh, acres more profitable. And as you can see there, that uh, uh, he still had a return on some of his investment, not a great return, but some. On the left, uh, left picture, you can see yellow strikes on three or four different places. You got to remember that this farm was uh, about a, it's all HEL, 65% HEL. Uh, the red areas were farmed and uh, farmed heavy over the last 100, 150 years. Plowed, eroded the whole nine yards. So there's a rebuilding coming in those areas. I applied 28% on those yellow stripes. They did make a little uh, improvement, but on the right-hand side of the left picture, the top where the road divides the top from the bottom, you can see in the bottom the yellow stripe stripe does not go clear to the bottom. For some reason, the 28 did not get uh, to the ground. It was put on afterwards, and our conclusion now is, and there's uh, Blake's got. Uh, some Blake Vance from Canada's got some input on it too. The 28 never made it to the ground. It got captured by the rye. And the glyphosate got translocated to the roots, which is what they say it will do. And then my non GMO corn attached to those roots to feed them. It took a hit. Uh, the glyphosate actually took the hair roots right off of the corn plants, and uh, I think that was some of the problem was understanding how these chemicals work and how what happens to them as we uh, apply some of these uh, uh, products later on in the season. You know. But you've seen the picture of the 2014 corn in June before the roots started to, to feed off of that. It looked like it was going to be one way over crop, and then we end up with what we got in the fall. The picture on the right is what it did last year for us. You see very little red. Uh, there are, you see a black area. That's because somebody ain't smart enough to know how to make his computer make that go away. On the combine, it's it's measuring feet instead of yield, and I don't know which button I didn't push. But right beside of that is a zero urea plot. It made 45 bushel. In 14, uh, we didn't get 45 bushel out of a lot of those areas. So there is a major difference in the amount of nitrogen that is being upheld into the, the cover crops where the rye and or the six the 16 yield the urea infiltrated through the rye down to the soil and made the uh, uh, nitrogen go to the crop and that's why all the red has taken i haven't been able to go to the mixes because when we planted the mixes in 13 and 14 they died, and the conclusion was that there was so much Roundup in the soil that it was uh, killing, killing our, or stunting our mixes. Now, you'll not get any chemical person to say, and I'll probably catch all kinds of holy for talking about it, but that's actual uh, facts, and Blake has the same results last year. And we also, on the right, what we want to show you is that after three or four years, this will be the fourth Seventh year. The seventh year, we're seeing great improvements in the soils. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, we went from 40s to uh, better than 100 uh, in those yields. You know, uh, and like Keith said, this is uh, 20 miles due east of here, uh, in the, really in the foothills of the Appalachians. You know, uh, probably Keith didn't give it justice if you uh, see the air cedar out there. Uh, we go down and do his seedings in the fall. And uh, I send Jay there because he's smart enough to sit on the seat because uh, the 90-foot boom catches on the ground between the hills. 
when it's all the way up. So that's how steep the ground is, you know. Uh, so we're making remarkable changes and uh, learning a lot in the meantime. These are what the Haney tests called for in those uh, three different years and what I applied in red. As you can see in 2012, when you seen our 100 bushel yield, it was only calling for like 20 units of N. I did some strip plots with nitrogen and there was absolutely no, no benefit to it. And Rick is going to get into the nitrogen part of my soil test. 14 was calling for 110 on 40. I didn't put any on except in the plots, but I don't think it will from what we've end result of all the late nights and early mornings of thinking and working on scenarios that uh, the roundup was, the glyphosate was not going to allow those uh, nutrients that were in the soil because you can see in 16 how much of an improvement. It called for 93 pounds of N. I put 94 on. We got 140 bushel on the test plots. The whole farm averaged 110. And it needed 47 units of phosphorus according to this test. I think the rye delivered the amount of phosphorus that we needed. This won't stay on. There's the soybean crop after the 2014 uh, disaster year. That's uh, 25, 26. 28 inches, maybe longer. I can't get my glasses on. You, you don't either, so you can't see it either. <laughs> and I'm sure it's not big enough to be seen up there, but that's 66 bushel yield on 600 acres. The farm, uh, that's the map for the 2015 soybean crop. You see that the red has pretty much all disappeared except down in the bottom of that uh, 100 acre field. And those are some eroded, terribly uh, eroded fields that's been farmed forever. What I'd like for you to understand is how I do my figure. And uh, I don't come up with anything like Gabe does, but I ain't been at it as long either. I take the seed, the chemical, and the fertilize and add those figures and divide those by the price of grain. On the conventional farm, which I have a uh, share of, uh, you can see that they, it's still being used with triple stack seed, planter fertilized, broadcast fertilized, uh, 200 pounds in applied, and two herbicide applications. Those two figures are $110 per acre compared to 364. If you divide that by the 370, it's going to, it takes my farm 29 bushels to pay for my input cost, where it takes on the conventional farm, it's taken 98 bushels just to pay for the seed, the chemicals, and the fertilizer. We're all sitting here trying to figure out how to make money or to cut cost, and still everybody thinks they got to have the 250 or 300 bushel yield. And as Gabe mentioned, the $7 a bushel to pay for the guy's uh, top yield in the country. So you got $352 left to pay for what I call the Taj Mahal. And everybody's Taj Mahal is different, but everybody in this room is within five or ten dollars of what we're all paying for the seed, the chemicals, and the fertilizer. So I try to separate that out and let you all do the calculations on your own farm to see how much difference there is between what you're doing and what you can do. We also wanted to show you there that uh, you know case yields was 125 and he still made $352 uh, after the fertilizer and the seed cost and his, uh, his brother's farm was totally conventional. Uh, he only made $200. And uh, I'm quite sure that the uh, $200 investment won't pay for his fixed cost of 
what he's got to pay for, you know. On that, on our farm, on our, this is, these, are, these were six-year average figures that I gave you. That's $90,000. How many in here would love to be able to figure out how to have 90 more thousand dollars to pay for their uh, Taj Mahal, as I call it? Uh, it's not impossible. If you look at when inputs were $200 an acre more when fertilizer was sky high a couple years ago, grain prices weren't that good. That was that $3.70 figure, that was a six year average on our sales price. $210,000 that I had less cost than, than the other farm. That's substantial. And cover crops are bringing things along. Anything to add? Comparing the two farms on soybean yields, uh, I was averaging a uh, field history of uh, 50 bushel, come up with 66. The conventional farm is average to 40, 45, and then 15, it only made 46. So I'm increased 66, or 16 bushels on uh, my bean yield without any fertilizer since 2012. And we also, we also showed Keith there that if, he, if we used rye after the corn, that he could increase his yields significantly. And most of the guys we work with that uh, tend to only do uh, cover crops one out of three years, one out of two years, uh, where we put rye in, corn, they go to soybeans and no-till them. We're showing them about a seven bushel increase just by using the rye uh, to enhance the yields around our farm here. I am going back to beans this year. Uh, we have the rye, rye and rape covered. Uh, the rape is beginning to grow, uh, which it hasn't done in the years past, but I think you'll see in the chart that I've got where the uh, later on here how I think we have washed out all the salt and chemicals out of the soil. You got your other savings to go on top of everything. You're eliminating tillage practices. You're eliminating equip equipment. As Gabe talked about the natural predators, we've eliminated all of the uh, fungicides and insecticides. As you'll see in the chart coming up, the uh, soil health has just taken off. And cover crop residue has eliminated my weeds. I am using Liberty Beans again only because I want to make sure that the mare's tail that was present in 2010 doesn't show its ugly face again this year. I've got a way to take it out. Also, reduce soil erosion, reduce your hard pan, and we have uh, grandchildren in Montana and the time that it, uh, I don't spend in a tractor tilling the soil and losing my carbon and all the other indiscretionary things that come along, uh, we get to enjoy the kids. This is the main focus of my farm. To me, this is a chemical addiction, same as a drug user on going through rehab and finally gets clean. You can see the soil health in the beginning of 2012. Uh, the green line at the top was an alfalfa field that had been, been in alfalfa for 20 years. Soil health wasn't too bad on it, but you can see how with fertilizer and uh, chemicals, they dropped down and the others dropped, just crashed in 14, summer of 14 with which with Ray and everybody else, we've deducted that it had to be the amount of Roundup and chemical that was still in the soil from other years. 15, it shows how it came up to 12, and then the bean crop come off, and we dropped back down to, to those levels that were there. But as you can see, how much greater improvement after the bean crop come off and the soil test taken, and by accident, doing a chemical plot behind the shop, 
of 20 different plots and soil testing those the 1st of May, the 29th of May, the 9th of June, and the 29th of June. Look at the spike between May 1st of 14 going clear up to 23 and 24. Just in a month's time, leaving that rye grow uh, and planting later. We've increased, you know, got more nutrients there available, and uh, it really, it was strictly by accident that we come that way. And you sit and look at the tests on paper, you don't see it, but Jay was good enough to put this chart together for me. And it just speaks volumes of how parts of the field, parts of the farm have uh, made their improvements. And when you get higher highs and higher lows, I think a statistician, which I'm not, calls that progress. Uh, so the left-hand bar that's going up and down, uh, that's actually his soil health index score. Uh, that's those numbers from 25 to 25. And the bottom axis is the days that he actually took soil samples. And uh, Senator Rick uh, Haney to have him tested and uh, uh, didn't realize that working with Keith, we would create such a monster that uh, every three months he'd go take a soil sample and send it to Rick. But I think Rick was able to use that to get more money from the government, you know. No. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but as you can see all those dates, those are dates actual soil samples were sent and readings were taken because we were trying to figure out how fast we can change the soil. And as you can see, you know, uh, some of those uh, soil health index numbers was uh, about three. And, you know, we got as high as 25 to 26. And we're now uh, regrowing it. And those, some of those lower figures are right after harvest. So we expect the soil index to go down and build over winter because of the cover crop we had there. And like he says, the longer we leave the cover grow in the spring, the higher the index gets. Uh, before planting, you know, I thought that was a great, there was a great bunch of charts there, and uh, uh, I think if we unrolled all his uh, information, it would go from here to the door, trying to figure it out, you know. Uh, but uh, it's been real encouraging to see these things and trying to learn because uh, Keith did a much better job keeping track of what what he's done in four years versus what I've done in 50 years, you know. So I got to congratulate him on that. Speaking of those notes, I've got a whole bunch of them here that I wrote down. So if you want to read off of them, they, they will. I'm glad you brought that up about the thing because I forgot about that being in my pocket. You can go ahead and wind that up if you would, please. I quit doing political jokes because all of them seemed to get elected after that. So. <laughs> I heard a guy tell last week that uh, he went to the Ohio State University for four and a half years, and he finally made it to sophomore. <laughs> so uh, we kind of feel that way in uh, soil health, that there's uh, very little science or anything backing us up, but we're, we're making improvements. I'm making improvements, uh, and it uh, is not something that uh, you what I do more of now than anything is think, trying to figure out why, like in 14, why that happened. And I'm definitely glad that I didn't give it up when you're looking at that. I think another comment, too, since Keith went from conventional, uh, you know, and all the tractor hours he put on, uh, and he's, uh, he's now spending them, as you can see, manages his fields, being out there looking at what's going on, uh, you know, there's no magic wand, so when you plant these cover crops, it takes time to manage what you're doing. Uh, you need to be out the field and look at it, and uh, uh, this shows that Keith was really intense in doing that uh, because that's how we learned to take care of things. If uh, you weren't in the field to see what was going on, uh, sometimes problems happen and you don't see it till it's too late. So we're taking the tractor seed hours and changing that to time in the field, walking and seeing and learning. The Mon Montana grandkids was home uh, three years ago and they wanted to go fishing in the pond. I said, well, we'll go out in the field and dig some 
I think it was four years ago now, we couldn't find an earthworm. Now, when they come, they go out and dig their own because they're plentiful enough and they get to go fishing if uh, Grandpa's got enough time to take them and go out there. And they're getting old enough now that they can go out on their own. But the improvement of uh, water infiltration, there was gullies in, those, in that farm when I bought it that Dave and I and Ray could have all laid down in. You wouldn't have seen us. They're now healed back in at the... Uh, Jay don't get too much of a jolt when he goes over with the cedar. And uh, it's just been quite an amazing thing. These hard rains we've had here the last month and a half, I've got residue of the corn stalks washed in a small strip that's not as wide as the, this laptop. But before that, it would be washed out and taken down a foot, foot and a half deep. So you're, you're just gaining so many benefits that's not visual not to the pocketbook, but they're visual to the eye if you take time to look at it. And I can drive up and down the road now and look out and see dead soil everywhere. And then you go by and see somewhere there's no water stand, and you think, well, there's some better soil out there to be had. One more slide I think I got, and then we can go to. This is the roundup, the conclusion. And Derek and his wife took this last summer didn't take it, they Googled it up. This is a Google, because they were going, we were going down home after a class here. The outside, if you see the brown center, the outside around is where I'd sprayed Paraquat, and the inside I sprayed with Roundup, and I'd forgot that I'd done it. He showed me that, and we started looking and uh, climbing up on top of the bin and looking out, and you could actually see, uh, if you can see on both sides of that, uh, picture, which is not very wide, uh, more green, you don't see that brown area. So I will again, tr that was only with a quart of Roundup. This year I'm going to maintain those plots and use two quart and see if I can get a yield difference to show up in that. And of course what we're trying to show you is there that uh, the gramoxone around the field didn't suppress the cover. and we probably lost uh, 40 to 60 percent of the cover where the brown is. You know, uh, it was really traumatic, and uh, uh, it's a hard thing for uh, for both of us to digest because we we were taught that supposedly those types of products have no soil residual. You know, and we're starting to see more and more of that, and uh, trying to learn how to handle this uh, problem a lot better. It's a learning process that uh, if somebody's looking for a miracle, this is not one that's going to draw you out of trouble this year. But as Ray, or Gabe showed, it can be done in three. I, my soils was a whole bunch worse probably than some that he was showing on those slides. And we're into the seventh year now, and it's made, uh, made a tremendous uh, change. We got two more little ditties, and then we'll open it up to questions. John Adams said, in his many years, he he came to the conclusion that a, a useless man is a is a slave. Two useless men are a law firm, and three useless men are Congress. <laughs> and we kind of see that happening right now. Mark Twain said the only difference between a tax man and a taxidermist is that the taxidermist leaves the skin. <laughs> the tax man takes about all of it. Questions, if there are any. Well, yes. Cover crop was seeded after the beans were harvested. Is that right? Yeah. That, that, yes. Yeah, after the beans. No, after the corn was harvested in 14. 14. And I'd seen such a disaster in the 14 crop that I wanted to use, make a plot, and behind the, the shop was, it kind of goes up so I can see it every day without having to walk out in it and climb up a bin and look out over it to see what changes were coming. That is a uh, early May picture at the time. 
and I'd noticed all winter and early spring that there wasn't a growth coming like there was in the rest of the farm and around that outside edge. And I'd forgot that I'd done it. Yes. The Roundup had been applied in, the May, in May of 2014, a quart and a half to the acre, for a burn down. And that's something that I, when we started this process, all of us were saying that, hey, cover crops are easy, all you got to do is round up and it'll kill them down. We had no idea we could stumble onto something like this. But, uh, you know, it opens it up to a whole new gamut of what else is happening uh, to, uh, and it's, it's you got to have the deep-rooted cover crops in order for the reaction to happen. Uh, if you're doing it in conventional and using uh, non-GMO seed and using Roundup for your uh, for a burn down or something that you don't have deep-rooted cover crop seed, you're probably not going to see as drastic of a reaction as we have. Yes. For a test, and I used it on the rest of the farm. Uh, you know, I can't remember which year that was. That was after the bean crop. Yeah, yeah. And I'd put it on and sprayed the rest of the farm down the year bef in 15 before the beans with Paraquat and then came back in and sowed the rye. So that was, that was a carryover from a 2015 um, spray. I have. Using Gramoxone at this point in time, uh, I'm, I haven't had a great success with ro uh, rolling, but now that I think I've gotten washed out, all the salts and the chemicals, and I'm going to leave the covers grow longer and let them get to a taller height and then roll them, and I think it'll take care of it. My problem was before that rolling uh, was going to mash down and not allow the seed to come up where the tractors, tires, and things rolled over it, but I think my soil health has improved to the extent that it's not going to pack like it used to. So we will be rolling some, some this, this spring. Probably we'll still use some Paraquat. I'm still looking for something different uh, other than Paraquat. And you can go with some 2,4-D, but that don't work real good when you're going to uh, plant green. So that's not going to work with planting beans. I answer your question. Yes, I am. I don't always agree with the allopathic gen uh, scenario that everybody's talking about. Uh, and I think with the amount of nitrogen that Rick's test is telling me that I need, it's, a, it's eliminating that particular portion. Because his test is accounting for the amount of uh, grass, the amount of rye that's being, being out in the field, that the, the nitrogen. So you're planting your corn green right into the standing rye. Yes, last year and the year before both, the corn was, the corn was pollen, or the rye was pollinated both years. I have red equipment, nothing against the green people, but I've always had the red. The neighbor down the road, his wife came home and said, Keith bought a new tractor, it's yellow. <laughs> he said, nope, he said the rye is just pollinating. It had pollinated enough that the tractor had actually changed color. Yeah. I guess as we were surveying things, we didn't see much change whether the soil was dark colored or light in Keith's uh, uh, fields. Uh, of course, the problem, the problem we have in Keith's farm, most of it is pretty light. There's very little dark soils in Keith's. Uh, 
Didn't see much difference. No, we have not seen any difference there. But, it's, you know. Uh, this picture shows you what, what has happened in uh, some of that. The, what you see white there is the tossel coming. So you can actually see the effect of the, the herbicide uh, or the cover crops uh, seedings there. Uh, some places the cover crop was thicker and some places it was thinner. And where it was thinner, the, the corn actually uh, pollinated or sent out a, a tossel sooner than where the rye was heavier. We plant that field crossways, but Jay, spray, uh, Jay seeds it north and south, the way you see the, the tassel shining. Right. And Jay's still learning how to run it. And that particular field had some, he'd come back in, worked on that, and the box was not quite as full as it should have been, and some of the outlets was uh, not seeding what it should. But uh, again, more learning experience. And uh, yeah. all this comes into uh, account on what we're doing. You need a, you need those oopses to answer other questions. Uh, at present on our farm, we're rolling about 45 percent of our corn crop and 100 percent of our bean crop, and in those cases, we need we use no burn downs or residuals. We can actually kill the crop with the roller. You know. Uh, where we use a burn down, we'll use, uh, we're using gramoxone. Uh, we have a little bit of uh, glyph or Roundup left over from last year, so of course we're not going to throw it away. We're going to use it up and then discontinue the use of it. Yes? In the areas where you have glyphosate damage, do you have anything else in the tank that might have held on to some glyphosate, like atrazine or something like that? I haven't used atrazine for. In fact, I got a pallet of it if you want to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> For about 10 years, there hadn't been any atrazine used. I saw another question. <laughs> if you find out, you can let us know. <laughs> yes, Bob. Well, on, on, our, on our high boy cedars, we're trying to get up close to 50 pounds the acre, uh, uh, because I figure about 10 pounds of that probably won't grow, because you're just blowing it on top. If we're drilling in, I like the 30 to 40 pound range, because our soils tend to be a lot of heavy clays, uh, poorly drained. Uh, so I like to see the sunlight and the wind come down in the spring to help dry it out. Uh, we found out on this farm and on Keith's farm, if the rye is actively growing, we can draw out about an inch of water out of the soil a day when it's actively growing, and that, that really helps us get uh, ready to plant, you know. In, in the case with uh, Keith's example here, before soybeans, we'll plant about 45 or 50 pounds of rye, and in front of corn, and that's with a one pound of rape, per acre, and then with the corn was 30 pounds of rye with five pounds of crimson clover and one pound of rape. Right. Uh, but we had, before the corn, we're not having good success with the crimson clover and rape. But like uh, Keith indicates, we're starting to get those ancillary, uh, the non soil cover crops are starting to really flourish better uh, in this situation as we get these soil health scores up. We are going to go to the mixes this coming fall because I think we've worst enough chemical out of the out of the soil that they will grow and do and we're going to either seed them at the uh, at uh, what would normally be con considered side dressing time uh, or have it flown on depending on how our workload is for everybody. Corn and beans and I'm still corn and beans. Because I, well, we had, we started out with the prevented planting, and then in 12 we had used up our, not, our triple stack corn and the rest of our fertilized. We went to the rye, the 70 pound acre, and harvested it for seed, and David sold it. Uh, then we went back, started back onto the corn and bean ratio, 
and uh, one year corn, one year beans, and that's basically because of my, um, that brings up another thing I just thought of, thank you for that question. <laughs> uh, because of the bin setup. I have two bins, a 36 and a 30 foot, and I can handle one, but if it rains and you got to go to beans, then you got to haul them to market, and I don't, I don't like to do that. I stumbled again on this, uh, the way I divide out and figure out the price, because if you, the other conventional farm is 50-50. If you look at the bottom tax line on that farm, there isn't a whole lot of loss every year. But when you take it like I do on my farm, one year one and one year the other, if we're losing money planting corn, why do we want to make the beans cost us? Because they're they're bringing back enough, they're paying enough that we can make make payment on some of the other bills. If if we can cut out the uh, res or cut out and go to covers, increase our profits on both of them. Uh, we've increased the yield because of the covers, and we've decreased our cost because of the covers in the corn crop. You're going to make more money. And hopefully someday I can be up to, to where the big money's out over here from North Dakota. I see he left. He got tired of me ragging on him. <laughs> at what point do you go in and uh, uh, plan your rye? I mean, Stop every hour or so and clean your radiator out. I, I think he's at the right time because, uh, you know, the taller the rye is, uh, and when you're planting and when it falls over, it's easier to kill. You know, uh, it crimps a lot better. Uh, and we have a lot better success with taller rye. You want to add to that, Jay? Any? Right, yeah. So the conventional wisdom is coming out that uh, for mechanical termination especially, the later is, is much better. Uh, you can never be too late to mechanically terminate the rye, but you can always be too early on that. And you have a period of time. Rye takes a little bit of time to set seed once it flowers. So you have about a week in there, I'll say conservatively, to get something done. And we'll see how that works on that. But I, like I say, the, the later is better with the rye as far as mechanical termination. But with herbicide, you can kill it any time. We've had other reports where guys terminated early in April and then didn't get the others terminated until it pollinated. They replanted three times in the bean field that they terminated early. The late where they rolled it down, they didn't have a problem with slugs. The slugs will feed on the green material that is out there. If you terminate it early and it's all brown, they're going to go after your case crop. So if you plant green, leave it it green and dies off, uh, the, the slugs are going to stay away from your cash crop to where you won't have the damage you're having, shouldn't have the damage you're having replant. We had another question over here. Gabe was talking about more diverse cocktail mixes, and you're talking about pretty simple mixes. Is there a reason for that? Because I'm a beginner, okay. and my rye and my cover, as I explained when we planted the mixes, they didn't grow in 13. I, I, we sprayed, no, we, we disc. The last time we disc was to seed the rye because I used uh, 100 pounds of DAP and 100 pounds of potash in a broadcast spreader to carry seed the rye to harvest for cover. Uh, then I come harvested that, sprayed, and a couple weeks later planted the mixes. They died. And uh, so I haven't been brave enough yet to get back to them, but that's why I say after seeing the soil health chart, I think we're clean enough now that I can go to mixes and uh, pick up on that. We've done some of that mainly because of weather. Uh, 
you know, we'll plant beans and, and uh, you know, Ohio weatherman only gets uh, $50,000 a year and uh, he's wrong 90% of the time. So we're going to pay him more money to be right. But uh, uh, when we get them planted and we don't get it rolled and it rains, we let it grow to, to grow out the moisture so we can have good, good emergence with the beans. Uh, so we've waited as much as two weeks to roll rye after planting and still been successful. Another question over here. Do you find any advantage to a particular variety of rye, or have you ever tried to predicate? We will. We haven't. I've just, with the troubles we've had, the rye would grow. It would be thin, and it didn't get the germ that I wanted, but the other stuff wasn't doing anything, so I didn't waste my money. We've used mainly VNS types. Recently, uh, we're growing Prima rye, which is what uh, Keith has used in the last two years. Um, and there are studies out. Uh, Wisconsin did some studies that showed marginal benefit based on timing in their area. Others, the uh, Aroostook rye is known to be earlier, so that's an option. Uh, Aroostook isn't widely available, and it's usually more expensive because it's not as prolific a seed producer as the VNS types. So there's some consideration there. If early is important to you and it's worth paying a couple more dollars a bushel, that's a good option from that standpoint. And that's kind of where some of the current research is looking at uh, from that standpoint. But those are some things. And triticale is a little later as far as maturity than rye. The three bushel. We, uh, we have seen a lot of uh, different things with VNS rye, and that's why we went to a, a variety of rye. Uh, some of our VNS ryes we were buying in the last four or five years all seem to have five or six different maturities. There'd be five or six different plants. Uh, and then when we went to one variety, uh, it was all the same. And that, that really made our uh, decision making a whole lot easier, you know. And, uh, you know, we like it thin. I don't like it thick because I, everything works better, you know. If you're organic, you're going to have to up the rates in order to have enough biomass to suppress the weeds. I broadcast it uh, as soon as I could, which was uh, about the three leaf stage, two to three leaf stage. As soon as I get in, it rained and we had to wait on it. I put nitrine in with it, uh, an inhibitor. And uh, when I pulled the soil sample in uh, the 8th of June, it was still calling for 90 un 93, 4 units of nitrogen. And when I pulled the sample at the end of June, it was the ni needed nitrogen was zero, so it had, that application had sufficed for the Haney test to say zero. All right, and so what about it? Keith used urea last year, and I think it worked a lot better uh, than the 28 just dribbled on the top, uh, because I think it, what we're seeing is with uh, four or five inches of thatch, that the, actually the 28 gets tied up in that thatch and don't get to the soil. So uh, the conclusion we come to, we don't like to dribble on top of the thatch. With 28, we like to knife it in. That seems to work better. Uh, we get better results, you know, that way. All right, so we've got to move on for lunch here. So uh, thank you, Keith and David. Thank you very much.